can I welcome you all to the second meeting of the Social Security Committee. Can I also remind everyone to turn off their mobile phones as they do interfere with the sound system. Uh, we have no apologies received, we're all here today, which is great. And can we go to agenda item one? And that is taking item four in private. If I could just explain to perhaps the new members of the committee the reason why we do take certain items in private. Uh, this particular uh, item it was, is actually relates to contents of research, uh, possible candidates for research and finances for the research. And it is normal practice to take uh, this particular item in uh, private. So I would ask the committee's indulgence. Uh, item number four, we would take it in private. Thank you. That's, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, agenda item two, uh, Scottish Government uh, Work Programme, Social Security Work Programme. I'd like to welcome Angela Constance, Cabinet Secretary for Community Social Security and Equalities, uh, here to give evidence uh, for the government uh, to the, the committee. Uh, accompanying officials are Stephen Kerr, Social Security Director, and Dan McVeigh, uh, Deputy Director, Social Security Policy and Delivery Division in the Scottish Government. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, for the joint correspondence which has been received by the committee and for appearing here today. I know you have a very busy schedule. And for members, I'd just like to highlight uh, two members of the committee. The Cabinet Secretary is available today uh, at this committee until 9.45. So if we have some quick questions and answers, uh, basically I think we'll get everyone in to be able to either one or two questions. As I know that Cabinet Secretary, you're leaving this committee to appear before the Equal Opportunities Committee. Uh, you have said you would like to uh, make an opening statement, Cabinet Secretary, so I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, colleagues. Uh, it will be uh, a brief uh, opening statement to allow as much time as possible uh, for questions. As the Convener says, um, I will be leaving this committee to go straight to the Equal uh, Opportunities Committee this morning. I am particularly pleased that uh, my portfolio area uh, allows uh, a real opportunity to take uh, a focused approach between social security, uh, communities and equalities. And I very much see uh, our vision of social security as helping to support uh, strong, sustainable communities and also as something uh, that is there for all of us uh, when we need it. And our new powers over social security will have a, a part to play uh, in helping to create a, a genuine uh, equality of opportunity for people who need our support most. Before I start, convener, I do want to recognise the work of the, the Welfare Reform Committee, uh, that work that took place in the, the last parliamentary session. The evidence gathering sessions of that committee uh, put in place for people directly impacted uh, by welfare reforms was sometimes very harrowing, uh, but uh, always uh, very valuable and thought-provoking. And I am very pleased to see that uh, the name of the committee has been changed to Social Security, uh, Language Matters, uh, and that's an important sign that we are listening to those who feel stigmatised uh, by some of the worst uh, strivers and shirkers uh, rhetoric. So, convener, I just want to briefly update on progress uh, on time scales. I'm quite clear that the most important thing is to take the time to, to get this right. Uh, this will be one of the most complex and difficult policy and delivery operations the Scottish Government has ever taken forward. The range of benefits to be devolved and the work required to take forward a social security agency are indeed substantial. Uh, and my absolute priority uh, is in ensuring the safe and secure delivery uh, of benefits so people can continue uh, to go about their daily life. On working with the UK Government, you will now have uh, received the, the readout of the recent meeting of the Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare. It was a constructive meeting and progress was made uh, on a number of issues. I'm particularly pleased that work can commence uh, to uh, progress a number of powers uh, in the Scotland Act next month. And 
Over the summer, I will be launching a consultation uh, on the work needed to take forward the first Social Security Bill. Um, it will be a very wide-ranging consultation, uh, touching on important uh, policy choices, uh, looking for views on how best to deliver our benefits, as well as asking for uh, views on issues ranging from information advice uh, and to uh, residency. And I'm keen to hear from all of those uh, who have an interest uh, in these areas. And I'm very happy to hear uh, any ideas that members have about how to support uh, that very important consultation. But alongside the consultation, we'll also be taking our, our next steps on the work needed to uh, deliver the Scottish Social Security Agency. Uh, the next phase in this work will be taking forward some of the practical considerations um, including some of the financial, uh, legal and logistical uh, requirements. And I know that the committee will be aware um, that the Scottish Government has already set out uh, a range of measures uh, that we believe will build a, a fairer uh, social security system. Um, and we, I believe that these measures will have a real impact on uh, improving people's lives uh, the length and breadth of Scotland. But for brevity, I'm not going to uh, repeat uh, those uh, commitments that are detailed in our manifesto and we've had some opportunity to debate in Parliament already. So I just want to finish by saying I believe Social Security is an investment to support people. I appreciate that you will rightly uh, question me in policy and delivery, uh, but I do hope that we can uh, build a consensus uh, and a consensus that we have uh, an opportunity uh, to do things uh, differently. And I very much uh, value the role uh, of parliamentarians and, in particular, uh, the work that will be uh, undertaken by this committee uh, as we proceed uh, on this, the, this journey together. And I look forward to working uh, with the committee very closely uh, in the weeks and months and years ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> I will open it up for questions to members. Could, could I perhaps uh, start off with the first uh, question? Uh, you did mention timescales, and we know that uh, May 2017 is there for basically the government's proposal for Scottish Parliament to introduce a bill, and obviously the implementation dates will be decided between yourselves and uh, the Joint Ministerial Group in Welfare. You mentioned about uh, launching the consultation during the summer months. Do you have any um, actual timescales for any particular uh, delivery or expect a timetable for any particular delivery de dealing with the various elements of the new powers that's coming uh, to the Scottish Parliament? That's what we are working towards, is that timetable uh, for uh, delivery. Um, Convener, you rightly point out that the, the, the vehicle for um, deciding uh, time scales and progress and approach uh, is indeed the Joint Ministerial Working Group. So this is a, a, a joint programme uh, of work between the Scottish Government and uh, the UK Government. It is important to stress that the transfer of powers is the first step uh, and you know we'll be working hard uh, on a range of workable solutions in this period uh, of transition. Uh, we've obviously You'll have seen from the, the note of the Joint Ministerial Working Group that uh, tranche one of the powers uh, will be commenced and the Secretary of State of Scotland uh, you know, will do that uh, via an order uh, before uh, the UK Parliament uh, rises. Uh, we will be working very closely, my officials will be working very closely with the DWP uh, and uh, the UK Government in terms of when the, the tranche two uh, powers uh, are uh, transferred. And I suppose, in essence, there's three broad um, planks to this work. There is the, the, the commencement uh, of the powers, uh, there is the legislation, and indeed we will uh, introduce that uh, bill to Parliament um, in the first year uh, of this Parliament, so it's a year one bill. And then we have to have the delivery mechanism uh, and that is, is in and around uh, the agency. So it is very much uh, a, a process. The consultation, you know, will commence uh, around August and will last uh, for, for, for three months. So it's not a consultation uh, that will go on forever because we do have a parliamentary uh, timetable uh, that we are uh, working, working towards. 
Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Mr Tonkins. And then <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'd like to um, thank the Cabinet Secretary for her opening statement, and I'd like to um, expressly associate myself with her remarks about the importance of language and rhetoric um, and uh, some of the language that has been used uh, by others that she rightly condemns is not the sort of language that I will be using. I'd also like to associate myself with her remarks about the importance of understanding um, the Cabinet Secretary's brief as being um, uh, communities and social security and equality, and these are not three different silos but are very closely uh, related uh, with, um, to one another. I, I wonder if I could ask a couple of, of uh, detailed uh, questions about the extremely helpful note that uh, uh, the Cabinet Secretary has provided the committee with about um, uh, this month's meeting of the Joint Ministerial Working Group. And the first question I had, uh, Convener, was um, about the difference between what's called tranche one and tranche two. Um, and uh, in, uh, in, in the note of paragraph uh, nine, we're told that tranche one uh, it comprises 11 of the 13 sections of the relevant um, uh, part of the Scotland Act. Um, and that tranche two um, presumably is the other two sections. Uh, can, can, can the Cabinet Secretary tell us which are the sections that are in tranche two and which are the, which are the sections that are in tra tranche one? Because the note doesn't actually tell us which... Uh, yes. provisions are in which tranche? Uh, tranche 2 is section 22 and section uh, 23. So, um, in essence, I mean, I think of tranche 2 uh, as the existing and ongoing benefits. So, that is the uh, responsibility uh, for uh, disability, industrial injuries, carers' benefits. Section 23 is uh, uh, benefits for maternity, funeral and heating expenses. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. And uh, second question, if I may, um, the, the, on, the on the same paper, um, and uh, this is actually just one question, Cabinet Secretary. The um, uh, last two paragraphs refer to papers that are going to be pre prepared for future meetings of the Joint Ministerial Working Group, a paper on flexibilities in universal credit and a paper on employability plans. Um, are those likely to be confidential papers to the Joint Ministerial Working Group, or are those likely to be papers that we might be able to have uh, sight of in due course? I can't give a very um, specific answer to that just now because I haven't. The papers have not been prepared, no, <laughs> um, and you know, members will appreciate that we do indeed want to share as much information as possible. You know, so if we are able uh, to share. Uh, papers, we of course would want to do that. I am conscious that in and around a massive organisation like the DWP that there can indeed be sensitivities uh, <coughs> in and around you know, c commercial sensitivities and you know, that the, the purpose of the Joint Ministerial Working Group, while we've got very clear commitments about notifying uh, members and committee when it meets and communicating you know, outcomes, it is um, a space for ministers to work together as ministers and you know hopefully uh, to you know iron out you know any issues that we may have um, and it is important that we have that space so i would want to share as much as possible thank you thank you very much mr mcpherson thank you good morning cabinet secretary i just wanted to ask some questions surrounding the joint ministerial group and the points about delivery and the logistical uh, challenge of that. I note in the, the terms of reference for the Joint Ministerial Working Group that there's a, an agreement to ensure a smooth transition of the new responsibilities to the Scottish Government. I just wondered if you had any comments around this transfer and any complexities involved in that, with the, for example, the quality of the data that the DWP holds in the, in the relevant areas, anything around the, the, the smooth transition and, and the delivery? Any? Yeah, it's it's all complex. Um, I'm not going to make uh, any any bones about that. Um, the transfer of some benefits will be more complex uh, than others. Um, if you know, if at a point, for example, probably the most complex area will be around DLE uh, and PIP. Um, we will indeed need to uh, share information. Uh, we will be very reliant on information, uh, facts and figures and stats and data uh, from the DWP. Um, and indeed, both governments will be wanting to test that and test the, the, the reliability uh, of that as, as, as we proceed. Um, and, you know, there's a, a genuine willingness 
uh, on both sides uh, the first or the first meeting of the joint ministerial group in terms of this parliament uh, was very positive i think ministers are very much uh, on the same page and our officials our respective officials have been working uh, very well with the, the, the dwp uh, so, so far Do you want to get back in again? Uh, that kind of answers the, the question as, as in, in the general terms that I was, was looking for. Just on the data specifically, is is, it, is there anything that um, have DWP commented so far on the on the quality of the data? Is are you confident in the, the, what what's being provided, and will that give you, will that help in the in the smooth transition process? I suppose I'm I'm, I'm encouraged by the. The, the, the tone of the discussions that I've had with both DWP staff and ministers. Um, but I have yet to, uh, I suppose, see uh, large chunks of data and that has yet to be tested. I am conscious that the DWP is a very large organisation that's going through a period uh, of substantial change. I mean, they've got the new state pension, uh, they're proceeding with the rollout. Uh, of PIP and uh, universal credit. Uh, we obviously have analysts uh, in the Scottish Government that it's their area of expertise uh, you know, to test the, the, the robustness of, of, of data. But I'll ask Stephen, is there anything that you would li like to add to that? I think um, when you, when you <coughs> mention the term data, I think of something very specific around people's personal information where they live, postcode information and so on. Um, you might be asking a broader question, though, about the material that DWP holds to allow us to do our work. And if that's um, the question that you're, you're asking and, and keen to hear about, I think um, we're quite pleased with the flow of information. We've had to put in place protocols between the DWP and the Scottish Government so that the information can move, so there is MOUs. We've got secure areas within our systems in the government to hold the information. And we've got protocols in place for how that information is treated and shared within the Scottish Government. So in terms of the work that we're doing, I'm quite happy that we're getting the information to be able to start to do the detailed planning that the Cabinet Secretary has referred to. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr Griffin, you wanted to come in? Thanks, Kavina. Um, and thanks, Cabinet Secretary, for the, the paper from the Joint Ministerial Working Group. I just had a, um, a question around um, timetable and implementation implementation dates. Um, will tranche one and two, will the commencement for those powers be completed before uh, the government introduces their bill um, <coughs> next May? Or, um, and will that mean that the commencement for providing benefits, will there be any disparity in timetables there? Or are you looking to commence delivery um, at, at one fixed date after the introduction of a bill? Well, <clears throat> it's really important to distinguish between uh, commencement and delivery of the powers. The, the, the legal commencement of powers is the first stage in a process and is some distance away from actually delivering you know, new benefits or um, existing benefits. And it is fair to say that, um, you know, that the government, the parliament will hold legislative competence, um, you know, for a while before uh, we have the responsibility for delivering. So, you know, we need to have, you know, the, the mechanisms and the delivery process and our agency, you know, up and running. So we will have, um, you know, legal responsibility before. Um, you know, some time before we're in a position to, to deliver. And I think we're already on record, convener, is saying that we're not going for a big bang approach here. Um, we're not going to, you know, come to a particular point in time, a particular date in history and switch on the lights. Um, because our, you know, calculations and work to date um, would show that that would increase the risk. And what we're about is reducing uh, the risk as far as possible. So that's why it is important uh, to think of this as, you know, overall a period of transition uh, and the, the benefits and delivery of benefits will come on stream in a phased and, and planned planned way. I, I can appreciate that and I think that, that's sensible. Are you able to give a, an indicative timeline of which benefits you expect to um, 
come online first uh, or sort of a, a programme of delivery? I mean, we certainly have some thinking uh, around that. I mean, I would be hesitant to give you a hierarchy or um, an order, um, but I think it is, you know, fair to say that, um, you know, some benefits like um, perhaps, you know, the new jobs grant um, or funeral payments um, or, um, you know, topping up carers' allowance, um, you know, maybe, you know, easier to implement than, you know, some of the, the issues around, you know, DLE and, and, and PIP. So, you know, we will, you know, want to come to, you know, a timetable and, and, and a plan and, and, and an order. But I'm, I'm hesitant to, you know, go through each one, one by one and attach a timeline because we're not at that stage yet. But it is something we would want to bring to committee so it can be discussed uh, and indeed uh, tested. But this is very much a, a phased approach. We're not going uh, for the big bang, reaching you know a date in history and switching all the lights on. Thank you. Oh, thank you. There's a number of members uh, you know, indicated they wanted to come in. Uh, Mr Adams was in the back of Mr Griffin's yes, question, yes. and then I think it's Mr Linters. Mr Adams. OK, uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. One of the things I was going to ask is, uh, you said that it's not like the big bang, the big switch on, let's get things sorted. Uh, is it not the case that you're effectively, some of the benefits you're inheriting are uh, coming from what, from the so-called Tory welfare reform, which is a bit of a broken system, uh, if I be so blunt. And uh, we have to make sure that we get these right, you know, especially with DLA and PIP. You know, we're dealing with a lot of vulnerable adults, vulnerable people who, who are looking towards us to actually finally get this uh, on the right track. And it, is it not the case that it's important that not so much talk about timelines, but actually getting the system to work properly for these people? I understand why timelines are important to people. I understand why people will want to very much press uh, the government uh, on you know, our plans and our timelines. Um, we certainly have a, a clear commitment that you know, the agency um, you know, has to be introduced and you know, up and running over the lifetime of this parliament. And of course, we have manifesto commitments. So there is a broad, um, you know, uh, five years. There's a programme of activity we want to pursue over uh, the next uh, five years. But of course, the priority, the absolute priority is, is getting this right, because people rely on getting the benefits. So we need to ensure that they get the right amount of money on the right time. Um, and we can't we can't compromise uh, on that. And I suppose the way I uh, think of it, we will um, through the Scotland Act we will get 15% of social security uh, spend in Scotland. Uh, we are taking out powers and benefits from a system that has evolved since the post-war period. It's evolved, and I, th and I think it's fair to say in quite a piecemeal fashion over the last 50, 60 years. So we're going to take that out, but we have to ensure, particularly in terms of passport benefits, that what we take out is also, you know, plumbed in, so that that 15% that we get is also plumbed in and connected to the remaining uh, 85%. Uh, so, you know, this is uh, particularly uh, complex and we'll proceed with caution and care. but. You know, all politicians are, are ambitious, they're impatient. You know, we want these powers because we want to do things uh, differently. But that has to be tempered uh, with, with getting it right because failure is not an option. I think uh, that's one of the things that with only 15% of the actual powers and having to work with a system that's already there, it's quite challenging. But one of the other aspects I would ask is that, you know, one of the biggest things that I get coming through my door all the time is the MSP, and you'll probably be the same, Cabinet Secretary, is sanctions. Now, you know, benefit sanctions. Now, that's one of the things we can't touch, uh, if I'm correct there, you know. Uh, but that's one of the issues that's having a dramatic effect in our communities where people are actually getting their benefits sanctioned. And, you know, I've got some tragic stories of a young man that gets sanctioned because he went to Aberdeen for a job interview and didn't turn up, you know, and everybody could tell very similar stories. Now, is it not just a case of, uh, you know, that uh, that makes it even more challenging for you is the fact that you've got 15% of uh, the actual sum total and you're trying to work 
within that system. You know, it's uh, we, we have to make sure that uh, the real issues that we are dealing with on a daily basis are issues like sanctions, like that young man that I was talking about that's coming in. Is there, what can we do to actually, because you can't actually change your benefits in, in the sanction side of things. You know, you can create other benefits, but I believe you're not allowed to do that. No, I mean, we don't have any uh, powers over uh, sanctions uh, and, you know, that, that's you know, been uh, repeated on, on a number of occasions. I suppose what, you know, I want to do as um, I proceed, um, th th this area is uh, riddled with politics. Uh, we will have our uh, differences of opinions uh, between the Scottish Government and the UK Government, uh, between political parties and, and, and parliamentarians. And of course, uh, I would have wanted uh, more uh, social security and welfare powers. Uh, but it's also important that you know, I focus <coughs> on what, what, we, what we do have. Uh, so I do try and disentangle the politics, and there'll be lots of politics in this as we progress. Um, you know, whether it's our debates and discussions uh, in chamber uh, or, or, or out with this 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 place, um, but I have to focus on what the powers that are coming our way and, and and making those work. And you're correct; we don't have powers over sanctions. Mr. Mr. Winter, she wanted to come in. Thank you, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned strong communities in your opening remarks, and I welcome that um, approach to these, these matters. I'm sure you'll agree with me that voluntary organisations can play a large part in strong communities. Following on from that, uh, two questions, one a more general question, the second perhaps more specific. Uh, first of all, what are the plans to bring in voluntary organisations into the consultation process with regards to implementing these new reforms as to how voluntary organisations can complement the social security benefits system that the government provides and work with the system? Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I don't want to go off too much um, in, in a tangent, but um, in my previous portfolios, I've had responsibilities for skills and employability programmes. Uh, and of course, the whole issue of employability is taken forward uh, by Jamie Hepburn and uh, Keith Brown. But I just want to, to reflect that some of the best employability programmes have been those um, that have been very person-centred and have actually been run by uh, the, the, the voluntary sector. Uh, so there is uh, a real role there for the voluntary sector and we have to keep them as part of our thinking about the way ahead. And the voluntary sector uh, and indeed social enterprise are absolutely crucial uh, in our consultation process in terms of the bill itself, but the broader uh, issues in and around the provision of social security uh, in, in Scotland. And I'm confident that they won't be shy in participating uh, in the consultation process, and that has to be welcomed. Following on from that, the, you talk about, of course, the provision and then the implementation. And one of the, the issues that has been raised with me and by constituents in Edinburgh and the Lothian is the, the actual mechanics of how it all fits together and how it all works. Are you going to look at the reform of DWP structures as these operate in Scotland as part of this process? Uh, if I can give an example, what has been raised with me by local volunteer organisations is the following. Some of the people that work with, volunteer for, or indeed benefit from the services of voluntary organisations are people who themselves claim benefits of one sort or another. And sometimes these can be complex for a lot of the individuals seeking to claim these, and they receive assistance from people who run voluntary organisations. But the difficulty that sometimes arises is on the DWP side, the lack of apparently a single point of contact. So a person whom the head of a volunteer organization or the person employed by the volunteer organization who assists with these applications deals with, they find that they are coming to a DWP office and having to deal with different individuals uh, who may not be up to speed on the particular issues that arise in relation to the applications made. So is that something that will be looked at in terms of the structuring and approach to 
dealing with claimants or indeed where they can be assisted by those in volunteer organisations who understand their needs? Of course, I'm not assuming any responsibility for the, for the DWP. The DWP, even when the, the new powers are operational, will continue to, um, be, to have a big presence in Scotland because they will have responsibility for uh, the other 85%. Um, uh, and, um, you know, in terms of, you know, their reforms and, and their structures, I mean, that's currently, um, as you'd expect, taken forward uh, by Stephen Crabb, the Secretary of State, uh, for DWP and uh, work, work and pensions um, and I will, you know, I am meeting him uh, next week um, next week will be the third time that I have uh, spoken to him and also I, I suppose in my discussions with uh, David Mundell and I'm sure he won't uh, mind me, me, me sharing this, I mean I think we are um, conscious that you know, we will have you know, different agencies and different services and we do need them to be working together um, on, on the ground. Um, there has been some work done in Scotland in terms of co-location of uh, Scottish skills agencies uh, with DWP, but that's been quite uh, small scale. In terms of my engagement, and this is an example with local housing associations, uh, they have worked very closely with the local authority in their area, and I've had a, a local authority member of staff actually working in their offices around things like discretionary housing payments and bedroom tax, and have found that very useful. So we will have to explore, you know, opportunities, you know, perhaps for things like co-location, because we don't want people passed uh, from uh, pillar to post. And as we, you know, assume responsibility for 15%, we still have to ensure that that's streamlined with other services that we're responsible for and fits uh, with services that, that we're not uh, responsible for. And, and the point that Mr Lindhurst raises about the kind of lack of flexibility, I'm conscious that for carers, they feel that uh, some of the, the criteria and regulations around uh, carers' allowance actually makes it very difficult for them to work uh, or indeed uh, study. And we do have you know, a working group uh, on you know, d disability issues you know, looking um, at some of that to you know, inform our thinking as, 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 as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Miss, no, I'm sorry. We're running out of time. We've got another three speaking. Well, people want to ask questions. Uh, Ruth McGuire. Convener. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'd like to ask a little more about the consultation. Um, I welcome that um, the third and voluntary sector are going to be involved. I wonder if we'll have um, an opportunity to go out into our communities and speak directly um, to people that um, require benefits and also sort of following on for that, what the opportunities are for co-production and the actual design of um, benefits. Before I answer um, Ms. Ms. McGuire's uh, question, just to say there's always a willingness on, on my behalf to you know, engage with members out with committee you know, through correspondence or, or, or meetings. <coughs> or, um, you know, we'll have an open door as, as, as much as possible. I don't want Mr Lindhurst to feel he's been uh, thwarted. Um, the point... <laughs> <laughs> the uh, point that uh, Ms McGuire makes is, is, is crucially uh, important. Our consultation document, um, with the best will in the world, is not going to be a light, brief document. Uh, we will work very hard, and we're in the, the throes of that just now, to ensure that it is accessible as possible. So we will uh, definitely, and we're planning this already, have a series of engagement events, uh, and I, you know, will very much encourage, you know, members, you know, to be thinking about how they engage with their own communities and their own local organisations as well, because, the, you know, that you, you're right. A lot of this consultation will have to be done face to face and speaking to people who have that lived experience uh, of of the benefits system. And I am conscious that there will be people who you know, have literacy difficulties. Uh, there will be people who aren't necessarily going to sit down and respond to the many questions in a consultation document, hence the importance of uh, charities in, in, in the third sector. 
um, who you know will have that insight into community life and that lived experience of, of individuals. But as ministers, you know, myself and Ms. Freeman, we're absolutely determined uh, to have as much face-to-face -face contact uh, with people who actually experience the system. Thank you, Ms. McGinley. Did you want to come back in again, or uh, just the point about co-production as well? No, ab 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 absolutely. Um, there are many partners in this. Uh, so, in terms of you know people with that uh, lived experience, and uh, we have already said that we will want to have user panels. I'm not sure that's the right name. I'm, I'm not quite comfortable with that, but we'll just call it a. Uh, a, a working title. Uh, so we'll be want, wanting to have that ongoing engagement uh, where people who have uh, used services are constantly uh, feeding in. Um, you know, we've got our partners uh, in local governments, we've got the voluntary uh, in, in third, third, third sector. And uh, you know, we, we have to you know, recognise that you know, government can't do this alone. There is no monopoly on wisdom. Or, or, or insight, so that, that, that ethos of partnership and co-production is very much one we'll take, take forward. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I'm sure the, the members here will be happy to you know, feed in <coughs> as well from, from the committee, and I'm sure you'll be looking forward to that. Um, Alison Johnson, then it's... Um, thank you, Convener. My apologies for missing the Cabinet Secretary's initial remarks. Um, I do welcome your open-door um, offer and appreciate that. Um, I think it's fair to say that probably if we were starting with a, with a blank canvas, um, there are lots of opportunities to, to do things differently. We are obviously constrained by the limitations of what has been devolved, and we can make big changes to things like assessment procedures that won't necessarily cost us any more money. Um, but I just want to focus on the issue of the people who, who, re, people who could be recipients who aren't at the moment because of the complexities um, of the system. In many cases, it's just another barrier for people who are already experiencing pretty difficult times. And I think that co-location point is well made, because you, you'll be aware, and I'm sure the convener will too, of the Healthier Wealthier Children Scheme in Glasgow, where midwives and health visitors were helping families fill out forms, and on average they increased um, their well, what they received by over £3,000 in a year. So I just wonder what sort of focus there will be in the consultation and so on to increase the accessibility you spoke about and to make sure those who can receive do receive what they're entitled to. I think it's a very good point, Convener. Um, we know that, the, or based on the information that we have to date, that the, the take-up rate of some benefits is particularly low. And I think you know, a prime example of that would be funeral uh, payments. Uh, I think maternity allowances has quite a comparatively low uh, take-up rate as well. Uh, we've got a clear manifesto commitment you know, um, over and above um, our, our commitments uh, to you know for new benefits and increasing carers allowance we have a very clear commitment around you know working to improve uh, take up take up rates um, mm. and I suppose a lot of the work on advice and information and income maximization is very important uh, in this area as well and that's why we're consulting uh, not just on you know the the nuts and bolts of what the, the legislation uh, will, will, will look like as, as, as well. Um, I'm very conscious that in these straightened financial times that we don't want to have a duplication of efforts uh, and you know we all live with the need for public service reform in terms of efficiency uh, and effectiveness but I am really conscious that in terms of some of the, the, the evidence that I've read um, that you need services at various entry points, uh, being aware of what people are entitled to and being able to advise people of, of what they're in entitled to. So that's kind of um, counterintuitive to you know streamlining uh, pro processes. So you know we can sometimes have a bit of lazy thinking around one-stop shops, important though they are, because we don't want folk passed from pillar to post. But we have to think about how the public sector you know, over the piece, you know, are there opportunities for our health service to be doing more to advise, you know, women of their rights uh, when we introduce our uh, best start uh, allowance, you know, 
people will be familiar with our plans in and around uh, the baby box. So we do need to be joining up all the dots. I think that's fair to say. Okay, thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Uh, Pauline. Thank you. Uh, good morning, um, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I don't think complex cuts it really. I mean, it just sounds hugely um, uh, complex. Um, I was interested to ask you if, um, so given the complexity then, unfortunately there is the potential for a lot to go wrong, isn't there? I mean, uh, you've got to think about that. And I think it's George Adam that alludes to, we really can't have a transitional period where benefit claimants get uh, disadvantaged by the transitional arrangements. And I wondered if you thought there was maybe need to put something in the bill to account for that in some way, to give some powers to the agency, if you like, uh, or the pre-arrangements for the agency to ensure that claimants don't lose out. And on the back of that, um, have you done any sort of forward planning on any gaps in expertise that you might need to run a new agency and could assist with transitional arrangements? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll ask Stephen to come in in a minute. I mean, the, the powers and functions of, of the agency is going to be a, a crucial part uh, of the legislation um, and as a crucial part of our consultation, although not the, not, not, not the only part. I mean, we are conscious that this is, you know, for all of us, unchartered uh, territory um, and that there will indeed um, be, you know, gaps in expertise and, and, and knowledge and we need to have the humility that when we come across that to, 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 to own it uh, and, and, and rectify it. Um, and that, that's why that, that working relationship uh, between the Scottish Government and the UK Government, but also, you know, tapping into the, the talents and expertise, you know, of the third sector and indeed people that have used uh, the services is, is, is really important as well. But I'll ask Stephen to maybe add a bit more detail to that. In terms of um, making sure people don't lose out, I think that is hardwired into the approach that we take. You know, if you look at what the UK government approach has been to change, um, it has been around testing and trialling and piloting change before it's introduced. Now, you will all have views on whether it's the right change and whether the change has actually worked. But that is the approach that we would take as well. So as the Cabinet Secretary says, when the switch is flicked, we've got strong certainty that the system's going to work that it's going to talk to the UK government system and that people, when they go to the cash machine and put their card in, get the money out. And if I can just share a personal story, I mean, I've got a personal commitment to this as well. My mother's a, a DLA recipient, so, you know, I need to make sure that she's not affected by the changes that are, are going on as well. Absolutely. I'll get it. I'll get it large. Um, <laughs> I don't mind it being in the record. She'll expect it to be in the record, I dare say. Um, in terms of skills and expertise, that is part of my key responsibility to build the capacity and to build the, the new organisation in the form of the agency. And being part of the UK government civil service or the UK civil service is helpful in that regard because we fish in a wide talent pool. I've just recruited a programme director to take forward the work who's had 20 years experience in the UK government leading large and complex programmes of change over multi-billion pound you know, spending levels. So we are looking hard and making sure that the appointments that we put in place give the whole program the biggest chance of success. And we expect to be coming as a team to talk to this committee from time to time about how that works going. Uh, practically absolutely on time then, 9.45, uh, just a couple of seconds to go. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, and your team also. Uh, it's going to be a very, very interesting committee, has been said as well. It's very complex. Uh, but we look forward to meeting with you again and uh, feeding in to any of the programmes and consultations that's coming about. Thank you very much and uh, look forward to your next committee meeting <laughs> and evidence. And, and thank you, convener. And uh, just to, to end on the note of saying, you know, my, my, my door is, uh, is, is always open, you know, formally or informally. We want to have as much engagement uh, with uh, all members uh, of the Scottish Parliament and we want to have an, an in-depth engagement uh, as we go forward in this joint venture together. Thank you. Um, agenda item three is... Uh, witnesses' expenses, uh, just to 
note, perhaps uh, once again for any new MSPs or, or people who are unfamiliar with the situation and witness the expenses, uh, the expenses are for travel or accommodation and people coming down to give evidence. And the norm in, in the, the committees is that uh, when any expenses come forward, the convener would be the person who would either say yay or nay. Uh, I just would open it up to the committee if they would like to continue on that vein or whether they prefer the committee to make the decision whether they say the expenses or the convener is the one it goes to. <laughs> <laughs> that was what I was looking for, delegate. Thank you very much, Alice. Is, is that agreed then? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, agenda item four is a research proposal which will be in private. Uh, members of the public, I think, have all left. Um, sound is off. <laughs>